Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Ramya Swamy. I'm from the Department of Ophthalmology from the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And I will be speaking to you today about common eye conditions that you're likely to encounter. And if we have some time at the end, I'd, I'd like to touch briefly about diabetic retinopathy as well. At any point, if you have any questions or any clarifications, please let me know. Uh, looking at the audience, it looks like most folks are medical students or residents. If you're medical students, can you raise your hands for me? So a good number. What about residents? And the folks in the suits, are you guys interviewing? Yes. Interviewing for? OK. And, and then we have some scattered faculty, I see. So I'll try to keep this sort of at the level of the trainees, the medical students and the residents, so you can get some um, basic knowledge. I don't have any disclosures. So this will be the basic outline of my talk. We'll start with some basic eye anatomy. There's, that's always a source of confusion for many people. We'll talk about components of an eye exam. Uh, and then we'll briefly talk about terminology. We speak our own language, so sometimes it's helpful for you guys to see what ophthalmologists were writing in our consult notes. Uh, and then we'll end with common eye conditions and their management. And then, like I said, if we have time, we'll touch about diabetic retinopathy. So the anatomy of the eye, you can see there's um, anatomy you could see in the front, which is these structures labeled here, the sclera, the white part of the eye, the conjunctiva, which is the thin covering that covers the sclera, uh, the eyelid, which is of course the protective structure that helps protect the eye from the environment, uh, the iris, which is the colored part of the eye, and the pupil, which is the opening in that iris, which allows light to enter the eye. So when we look at the eye in a cross section, uh, these are the structures in the front of the eye. We also have the cornea, which you can see, which is the dome-shaped, clear, optically clear structure that allows light to enter. Light enters the eye. The amount of light is controlled by the size of the pupil. The light is then further refracted or brought into focus by your eye's natural lens. And the lens brings the light into the back of the eye, into the retina, which then focuses the image and sends those nerve fiber layers through the optic nerve to the brain to be interpreted as vision. The eye also has several extraocular muscles. These help control the eye up, down, left, and right, and as well as provide internal and external rotation. There are also some parts inside the eye that are important. Remember, we talked about the cornea, and we talked about the iris. Where the cornea and the iris meet is the drainage angle. And many of you have heard about acute angle closure. When we're talking about angle closure, we're talking about this structure closing or no longer allowing fluid to drain. Normal fluid pathway in the eye, aqueous fluid is produced in the back of the eye. It comes forward through the pupil and it drains through the angle. So if the angle is occluded, the fluid is blocked and that's what leads to acute angle closure, which we'll talk about in a bit. And again, as I mentioned, the back of the eye, the retina, Perhaps the most important structures uh, for you to remember or for you to try to identify when you do direct ophthalmoscope is the optic nerve. You could see artery and vein sort of cursing around the optic nerve. Those are called the arcade vessels. All the retina that's in between the arcades is the macula. And the center of the macula is the fovea, which is responsible for your central vision. So what are the vital signs uh, of the eye? When we talk about vital signs for the rest of your exam, you talk about weight, blood pressure, heart rate. The eyes have their own set of vitals that we take. So these include visual acuity, which we'll talk about how to measure, uh, extraocular movements, visual field, so how much of peripheral vision someone has, um, pupillary function, as well as intraocular pressure. Uh, and for the medical students and the residents in particular, it's always important to check the vitals. Now, you wouldn't call a cardiology consult without telling your cardiologist what the heart rate is, what the blood pressure is, what the EKG is. You want to do the same for your ophthalmology colleagues to the best of your ability. At least check the vision. Everyone's capable of doing that. Every smartphone has an app that you could check the vision. So you always want to check the vision. Gather as much information. You never want to call saying, this person has blurry vision. That doesn't help a whole lot. So how do you check vision? You want to check each eye individually. So make sure one eye is covered because 
they act independent of each other. So you want to check them individually and you can check them. If you have a chart, you could see up to what line they read and you can quantify that. Now, if the vision's very poor, you can check to see if someone can see moving hand. They can count fingers. If they can see light or no light. If possible, you need to check both near vision and distance vision because there can be an issue with either or both. Pupils, this is a little bit more challenging, but a little bit more rewarding as well, because you could potentially catch some underlying issues if you find some abnormalities in pupillary function. So anisocoria, these are differently sized pupils. Now pupils can be differently sized and be physiologic, or they could be due to an underlying condition, like a third nerve palsy, Horner syndrome, um, and an APD, an afferent pupillary defect, where you have an abnormality with the functioning of the optic nerve, which you can catch by purely looking at the pupillary function. So I won't go into this in too much detail, uh, but this mentions what a normal pupillary exam should look like. If you shine light in one eye, that pupil should constrict. And because the pupil is innervated consensually, the other pupil should constrict as well. Now when you swing that flashlight over to the other eye, same thing should happen. If someone has an APD or a malfunctioning of their optic nerve stru structure, when you shine light into one eye, the nor let's call that the normal eye, the pupillary function is normal. So that eye constricts because that optic nerve is normal. It's sending signals saying it is detecting all of the light. The other eye should constrict as well because you're, the normal eye is getting the normal signal. When you swing your flashlight over to the abnormal eye, the abnormal eye is no longer sensing the same amount of light. So instead of constricting, it dilates because it has gone from a higher light setting to a lower light setting. And because it dilates, that's what we call an APD, where normally it should constrict when you're exposing eyes to the equal light. And that's how you catch an APD. What about intraocular pressure? We as ophthalmologists have many tools uh, to measure tonometry or intraocular pressure. And it's important for us to know what the pressure is because it can be related to an underlying condition like glaucoma or in a, a, a specific case of that would be acute angle closure. Um, or there could be other trauma to the eye. There could be blood in the eye. All of these could cause the, blood, uh, the eye pressure to be elevated. Similarly, if you have any trauma, say a rupture to the globe from a motor vehicle accident, something like that, the pressure can be low. So it's important to know what that is. Now, of course, you don't want to be checking pressures if you're suspecting a rupture or trauma to the eye or if there's any kind of abrasion. Now, if you don't have any tools to check the pressure, a good way to check the pressure is just by palpating. You can palpate your eye. You get a sense of what normal pressure is, and then you could palpate someone else's eye, and you could see what it is relative to where yours is. And that's a good way of telling at least if the eye is uh, you know, significantly different from the average pressure. Additional eye exam, extraocular movements. So this is when we're looking for things like double vision, muscle entrapment. And then, of course, a good external exam where you can learn a lot without any specialty tools. You could look at the lids. Um, so you could look for droopy eyelids, any cuts in the eyelids, proptosis. So this is when someone's eyes are bulging out. So in something like thyroid eye disease um, or even swelling. So swollen eyelids, upper and lower, uh, can indicate some underlying issues. And of course, ophthalmoscopy, where we're looking into the back of the eye. If you have ever tried, who has tried to use a direct ophthalmoscope successfully? One person. Um, so using a direct ophthalmoscope is a skill. So you're not going to learn it the first time you try it. The only way you're gonna learn it if you try it a lot. And the first few times it's really helpful to try it in someone you could dilate. So if you're able to dilate the person, you should at least be able to look at the three structures I talked about, the optic nerve, the arcades, as well as the macula. So like I, as I mentioned, ophthalmologists, we speak our own language. So if you've ever read an ophthalmology consult note, there's a lot of alphabet soup. And I've briefly written some of the what we talk about. So when you're reading a note, you know what to decipher. I'm not going to go into all of them in detail. But what I do want to bring to your attention are some of these right here because we will be referring to some of these. So when I say LLL, I'm talking about the lids, lashes, lacrimal system. SNC is sclera and conjunctiva. K is cornea. 
AC's anterior chamber. And this is helpful because when we talk about the common eye conditions, I will refer to some of these um, factors. So let's talk about some common eye conditions you might see um, in your general you know, internist, family medicine, practice, office. The most common probably one that you will encounter is red eye. Someone's calling in and they're saying, doctor, my eye is red, I'd like to come in, I'd like to be examined. Red eye can mean a whole bunch of things. It can go from the benign conjunctivitis or inflammation of the conjunctiva all the way down to, as I mentioned, acute glaucoma and ophthalmitis, which is an infection of the eye or even severe trauma. So how can you tell with basic tools, history and information, what is what and what can you do to treat those? So you of course have to determine what is the most likely source of the red eye. And then the second question is, can I provide initial treatment? Um, and then you need to know of course what that appropriate initial treatment is. And then you're wondering, should this patient be referred? And if they should, what is the time frame? Is it urgent? Is it subacute? So hopefully I'll try to answer some of those questions. So history, just like in medicine, is important in ophthalmology too. You want to know some basic information about the patient's demographics. As far as their symptoms, you want to know the redness. Get some characterization. Is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? Is it associated with a change in vision? Is it associated with pain, itching, foreign body sensation, photophobia, uh, brow ache? Uh, all of those can be clues towards determining what's going on. And then of course, don't forget the onset and the duration of symptoms. And then finally, things like trauma and sick contacts can be helpful in determining one way or the other. Now past ocular history is important, especially if someone say um, had recent surgery. So if someone's had recent surgery and they're complaining of red eye, they're very different than if someone has a kid in daycare and they're complaining of red eye. Uh, similarly, if you have a young college student who wears contact lenses, who calls in and says they have red eye and loss of vision, again, different picture. Uh, and then of course, if there's known family history or personal history of known conditions like cataracts or glaucoma, that can be helpful as well. Um, the eye a lot of times is uh, like the canary in the coal mine. It could be the first place a lot of systemic diseases are manifest for um, things like there, I did my training in, in a large county hospital and um, about 50% of the patients I diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy, I was the first provider telling them they had diabetes uh, and that was the startup to their um, workup. So things like early hypertension, early diabetes, things like that, especially if your patient population isn't one that's plugged into healthcare regularly, the eye might be the first place you catch these things. A lot of systemic autoimmune conditions can present with inflammation in the eye as the first sign. And of course, there are the great masqueraders like TB and syphilis, which can always present in the eye as well. Don't forget medications. There are a lot of prescription medications, but there are also a lot of over-the-counter medications that you could go out and buy. If you go to your local pharmacist, pharmacy and go to the eye section, you can see a bunch of over-the-counter drops and a lot of them um, can cause eye symptoms. And then systemic medications, especially steroids, chemotherapeutic agents, and certain immunosuppressive drugs can also affect um, eye symptoms. So let's talk, so we mentioned red eye is the most common. So one way when you're examining the patient to determine what might be the source of the red eye is to look at causes of what might be causing this redness going from the front to the back of the eye. And like I said, we like to work our way in a systematic fashion. So we'll go from the lids, lashes, then we'll go to the sclera, conjunctiva, then we'll look at the cornea, and then we'll look at the anterior chamber. So outside to in. So lids and lashes. Again, you don't need special equipment to look at this. You can bring someone close to you and you can look at them and there'll be lots of signs for, of things you can catch. So that right there is called scurf. So these are little dandruff-like particles that can s exist in the um, eyelashes. It's very common. Um, if, you, if, if you examine someone close enough, you'll pick this up in more people than you think you might. Um, meibomian gland disease. So if you just flip the eyelid just a little bit, right under the lash are little oil-producing glands. And if those oil-producing glands clog up, you could see plugged up oil glands. We call that meibomian gland disease. And of course the lid itself, if the lid is unable to close, 
What cranial nerve palsy would that be if they're unable to close their eye? Anyone know? I heard seven, someone say seven, yep. So cranial palsy seven can give you lag of thalmos. So inability to close the eye uh, can leave the eye exposed and at risk of having um, complications related to dryness and a setup for a future infection. Any questions so far before I move on? Okay. And then of course, we mentioned plugged up oil glands. If they aren't treated with warm compresses, and resolve, it can lead to something called a chalazian or a sty, which can be um, sterile, or if it gets infected, it can uh, proceed to be preceptal cellulitis as well. And these are more pictures of some of the same things. What these can do is these are highly inflammatory, so if any of this debris uh, falls into the eye, you can get sort of a dry eye conjunctival irritation. How do you treat this? So if someone's coming in with uh, these of your, uh, scurf, plugged up oil glands. Usually they have symptoms of dryness as well. If they're coming in to you with these symptoms, the treatment you can absolutely recommend to them is warm compresses. Warm compresses where they're just paying attention to their lids, massaging it, the warm heat will melt the oils, the massage will dislodge any of the debris. If they do this twice a day, that's typically all they need. In addition, they can supplement with some artificial tears or some ointment to help um, unload some of the bacterial burden that has built up. So moving from lids to conjunctiva sclera. So conjunctivitis, probably the second most common uh, eye condition you're likely to encounter. And conjunctivitis can be viral, bacterial, um, it can be um, allergic, or it can be from chemical. And we'll talk about all of those and how to distinguish from them. Viral conjunctivitis is probably the most common. This is your typical sort of red eye um, a patient. They usually present with itchy, watery eyes. Um, their eyes are usually sort of very irritated. And more likely than not, either they have both eyes involved, or if they have one eye involved, it is very likely to spread to the other eye as well because it is highly contagious. Um, they will have preauricular node inflammation. And usually they will tell you a history of having had a recent upper respiratory infection or a cold or something like that. This is highly contagious, so if you see this patient in your clinic, you want to wipe and wash everything down, including your hands. Um, you also need to tell them to take time off work because you don't want them to spread it to other people at work. Treatment is conservative, so just more, again, cool compresses, artificial tears. Um, do not prescribe antibiotic drops for this. Your instinct will be to say, something's red, I want to throw something at it, antibiotic. We'll talk about which ones will benefit from that. Those are the bacterial conjunctivitis, which look very different from this. Viral conjunctivitis, of course, we talked about sort of the garden variety, the same bugs that cause your common colds and your upper respiratory infections, but it could also be from like a zoster. Now this is more serious. So if this is a patient with history of chicken pox, history of, you know, if they present like this patient is here, especially with V1, V2, V3 distribution, um, you definitely want to refer them to an ophthalmologist urgently because they could have corneal involvement. Again, this is something that is going to need systemic treatment, either oral or IV antiviral, so this is not something you want to sit on. Bacterial conjunctivitis. Now remember viral, I said it's watery discharge, there's itchiness, uh, you can feel the preauricular nodes. Bacterial conjunctivitis, it's more uh, apparent, so it's red. There's mucopurulent discharge most of the time. And typically you can swab these for culture. So if you're not certain, you could always swab for culture and send it for culture. Um, it looks like that. So, so ignore the bottom ones, but, but that is what it typically looks like. So you have a lot of mucopurulent discharge, the eye is injected, the eye is red. These are ones you could prescribe topical antibiotic drops. So things like polytrim, um, you know, fluoroquinolone eye drop is a good one as well. It gives you pretty broad coverage. The pictures in the bottom are gonococcal conjunctivitis, which are a much more serious uh, condition because it can lead to perforation of the eye. And of course, if you see anything close to those pictures, 
you do not want to treat those anyway, so you're sending those to the emergency room. Chemical conjunctiv conjunctivitis, uh, you'll be shocked how often you might see this, um, especially in more urban settings because as people work with more chemicals and don't wear eye protection all the time, these are splash injuries. You know, domestic help working with cleaning equipment, something splashes in the eye, someone working in the field, something splashes in the eye. Uh, if they present with that history, you're immediately, you should try to irrigate the eye, wash them out. So even just a bag of normal saline uh, is plenty to try to irrigate the eye. If you have access to pH strips, um, you could check, you could stick a little strip in the fornix to check what the pH is. And if the pH is either basic or acidic, so it's seven is normal. So if it's one way or the other, you want to keep irrigating it till it normalizes to seven. Most emergency rooms are set up for this, so if you have someone come in with a chemical injury, you're not sure what to do. It's never a bad idea to irrigate them initially, send them to the emergency room so they could be taken care of. And, and in these cases, um, base or alkali is much worse than acid because it can penetrate deeper into the different layers of the eye. Allergic conjunctivitis, again, depending on what part of the country you're in and uh, whether it's sort of spring or fall allergies, another very common um, condition you're likely to see. Maryland, very common. Um, again, the hallmark is itching. So viral, allergic, things you're going to treat conservatively are going to have this watery discharge. Itching is the predominant uh, symptom. And a lot of times these folks will also tell you other um, systemic allergic uh, symptoms such as itchy throat, runny nose, uh, they're already taking some kind of antihistamine. If they're not, you can uh, prescribe some for them. So sometimes if they have systemic symptoms, you, you can prescribe a, you know, like a Claritin um, or an Allegra or something like that and it'll resolve most of their symptoms. Unlike the viral, these folks have no lymph node involvement, so that's a good way to distinguish between the two. As well, otherwise treatment is fairly conservative, cool compresses, artificial tears. There are plenty of over-the-counter um, antihistamines. A good one to remember is this Zatador. Uh, it could be used twice a day and most people get good relief with it. Now, allergic conjunctivitis can also have many of these signs. If you're able to look at the lid at all, they have a lot of these follicles and papillae and they have swelling of their conjunctiva. So you could see it sort of ballooned up. We call that chemosis. Now, we talk, uh, sticking with conjunctiva, we talked about some infectious, non-infectious causes. What about trauma? What about blood in the conjunctiva? Let's start with the one in the bottom. Uh, the typical story for someone who presents like this is, I woke up in the morning, I went to go wash my face, I saw my eye, and I panicked. Uh, so this is one that looks worse uh, than it really is. So this one's very benign. Uh, it looks worse than it is. There's usually no change in vision. A lot of times these folks either have hypertension or on some kind of blood thinner, aspirin, warfarin. So they're waking up in the morning, they have a little break in a tiny blood vessel in the conjunctiva. Remember I said conjunctiva is a clear layer, it has trapped the blood against the sclera, so it looks bad, but it's really not harmful. They don't need to see an eye doctor, they don't really need to do anything, they just have to wait it out like a bruise. So you tell them two weeks, the blood will change color, it'll become yellow and brown, and then slowly um, get better. That is different from hemorrhagic chemosis. Remember I said chemosis is swelling of the conjunctiva and if you have hemorrhage with that swelling, particularly if it is in the setting of trauma. And the trauma can be mild. It could be someone's playing baseball and the ball hit them in the eye or they're in a motor vehicle accident or something much worse. Uh, even if it fulfills all the other criteria, you know, like say they're on war warfarin, say they have high blood pressure, if the conjunctiva and the blood is all the way around, or 360, especially in the setting of trauma, we have to be suspicious of something called an open globe or penetrating or perforating injury of the eye. Uh, and that should be sent to a level one trauma center or center equipped to care for it um, urgently. Other things that can make the eye red um, are inflammatory processes. So these are things like episcleritis and scleritis. I won't spend too much time on this except to say episcleritis is milder. It tends to present with inflammation 
of the episclera, which is the superficial layer of the sclera. It tends to be usually sectoral, so it's not diffuse. It, it's in sort of one little area, but it is deeper to the conjunctiva. So if you take a Q-tip and move the conjunctiva, you will see that these vessels are deeper to the thinner layer. And they have a lot of tortuosity to it. You could see these vessels are sort of corkscrewed and tortuous. Typically, nothing to do for these. They resolve on their own. Sometimes they resolve with a little bit of oral NSAIDs or topical NSAIDs even. Uh, sometimes they could be indicative of underlying inflammatory or rheumatologic conditions. Much more serious is scleritis, which is inflammation in the sclera itself or the white part of the eye. And this, more likely than not, is associated with some kind of systemic autoimmune condition. This is urgent, this is serious. You can see here and here you have so much inflammation in the sclera that the sclera has melted away, revealing the choroid or the inner darker part uh, of the eye. And again, so you can imagine this area is at high risk of perforation. So if they have even minor injury, they could perforate. So, and more, more importantly, this inflammation might be ongoing if they're not treated. This typically needs systemic immunosuppression starting with steroids and then transitioning to other disease-modifying treatments that are steroid-sparing. Again, urgent referral for those. Moving further back in the eye, we've done sclera, cornea, uh, sclera conjunctiva. We'll talk about the cornea. We're also getting into the parts of the eye where examination with, uh, without a slit lamp is going to be a little bit difficult. But if you have access to any of these tools, so fluorescein dye or a prepare cane or tetracaine eye drop which numbs the eye in a fluorescein strip, you're able to stain the cornea to help you out. And you need a blue filter typically. So if you have access to that or an ophthalmoscope with a blue filter, um, you can look at things like this. So all of these are showing staining of different structures in the eye. So here we see sort of a, a linear stain, which is likely a superficial abrasion. So this could be like a nail abrasion, someone accidentally scratched their eye or something like that. This is very classic dendritic pattern. So that's a herpetic infection, herpetic keratitis. And this right there could be many things, including exposure. You could see most of it is in the bottom part, central and bottom. So this could be someone like a picture I showed you a few slides earlier where they couldn't close their eyes all the way. So this could be exposure keratopathy. And of course, the thing we most worry about is a corneal ulcer. So these are all, again, different stages of ulcer. This is probably the least, uh, the most mild stage. Very common in contact lens wearers. So if someone's coming to you with eye redness, pain, light sensitivity, decrease in vision, and is a contact lens wearer with poor hygiene, this should be at the top of your list of what you're suspecting. So this is sparing the central axis. So this person's probably going to do okay as they, um, as they uh, heal. This is coming more into the central axis. And this is, of course, worst case scenario where the infection has spread into the anterior chamber. You have a hypopion or settling of pus in the AC and a large scar in the central part of the vision. If this person's eye survives, they will likely need a corneal transplant if they ever want to see again. So contact lenses are bad. This one's not as bad, but much more common, dry eyes. How many of you here have some symptom of dryness of their eyes? Almost everyone. It's the environment we live in and it's the devices we use, whether it's a tablet, a, f a computer, what have you. We're not blinking enough. We're in environments with low humidity and our eyes get dry. And when the eyes are dry, it actually causes these little punctate, little erosions in the surface of the cornea. And you can see that the erosions here are right in the central part of the eye because the lower lid is probably coming up to there, the upper lid is coming up to there. These are folks who are just staring at things and working and not blinking as frequently, so they're not replenishing their tear film. So these are folks you want to counsel about taking breaks from work, if they're, if they're doing computer work all day, to step away every 30 minutes, step away every hour. And then initial treatment, at least, is to use some artificial tears. Abrasion, as I mentioned again, these are scratches of the superficial surface of the cornea. Uh, it could be due to a variety of reasons. If you do see sort of 
sloughing of the epithelium like some of these pictures are showing you, you can start them on some topical antibiotics. Again, this is to prevent this from turning into a uh, bigger infection. Now, of course, if they're contact lens wearers, things like that, it is worth referring because this could be an early infection as well. Pterygium and pinguecula are again common things you might see. They're not harmful. Uh, they're typically related to sun exposure uh, where you have this um, elastic tissue uh, degeneration that grows from the conjunctiva into the cornea. If it grows well into the cornea, it can obscure the visual axis. Uh, it can also cause astigmatism. It's sort of pushing on the cornea, changing the shape of the cornea. Uh, treatment is usually surgery to remove them, so these definitely need a referral. They're non-urgent. Uh, also, if they're in the early stage, like it is in this picture, you may want to counsel those patients to wear eye protection, wear sunglasses, UV protection, because UV rays are the main contributor uh, for these. Sometimes the ones up top can also be precancerous or cancerous. So if you do see something like this, you want to refer so they could be removed and biopsied. Other things you might encounter, foreign bodies. So someone using a drill, someone working with metal, not wearing eye protection, they could have a little metallic foreign body embed into the cornea. Uh, again, depending on how good your vision is, you might be able to see this without any extra equipment. A lot of times these folks will give you the history. They'll say, I was working with something, I felt like something went into the eye, my eye's been red and watery ever since. Uh, again, when they come to us, we usually take that little metallic foreign body out and we use a little drill to burr out the rust string. So even if these are there for like a day or two, it can form a little rust string. And the rust string can be harmful as well, even if the actual foreign body has come out. So we'll usually um, clean it up. Sometimes it could even have penetrated the eye and self-sealed uh, and, and everything else might look intact. So it's worth exploring to make sure uh, there's nothing in the back of the eye. And finally, anterior chamber. So that is that little chamber in front of the iris and behind the cornea that keeps the anterior chamber fluid. Um, common conditions you might see are things like traumatic iritis or anterior uveitis, which are basically inflammation in the anterior segment of the eye. Uh, traumatic iritis, very common if anyone's had any kind of injury. So someone who's been, who's had a sports injury, someone who's been punched in the eye or has had injury to the eye, the trauma of that can cause the iris to release pigment and cause inflammation in the eye. Typically self-limited, but it can present with pain, redness, photophobia, tearing. Usually if there's no change in vision, it can be watched and it'll resolve. That is different from anterior uveitis, which is inflammation in the eye secondary to some kind of inflammatory drive in the body. This typically will at least need treatment with topical steroids, topical cycloplegia. So again, one of the few cases where you want to get them to an ophthalmologist urgently. Uh, uveitis, as I mentioned, is one of those conditions that could be either infectious, autoimmune, inflammatory. We typically check for all of those markers. I've listed the labs. Usually for a first time episode, we don't, but if it's a recurrent episode, we check for them. Uh, a lot of times we'll find something like HLA B27 B positive, or more recently I'm seeing folks who have undiagnosed um, inflammatory bowel disease where their first presentation is um, anterior uveitis. So a lot of times this can be, um, like I said, the canary that could tell you about other inflammation in the body. So a lot of times the treatment for these, we do it in concert with primary care physician and or rheumatologist. Um, hypopion, so hypopion is inflammation that has settled down and formed a layer. This can again be infectious or non-infectious. If this is a patient who said, I had cataract surgery a month ago, now my vision's blurry, I have redness, and you could see this, that's an infection. So that person should be sent urgently for management. Either way, anytime you see this, it is not a good sign. So it is one of those things you want to send urgently. And finally, let's end with the um, acute angle uh, closure. So we talked about the anatomy. We talked about how there's aqueous produced in the back of the eye, 
it comes through the pupil and it drains through the angle. What happens in angle closure is, another name for angle closure is pupillary block. So you have your pupil blocked, in this case, by the lens itself. So there's fluid trying to come around the pupil, but it's unable to. So it bulges the iris anteriorly, which further closes that angle. So that is the mechanism behind acute angle closure. And when that happens, everything's being pushed anteriorly, the angle is closed, the fluid can't drain, the pressure goes up. Normal eye pressures are anywhere from 10 to 20. When this happens, pressures can shoot up to as high as 40 or 50 or even higher. So the patient's usually in severe pain. So that'll be the biggest complaint they will say. They'll say, this hurts so much, severe headache, worst headache of my life. They'll typically complain of nausea, vomiting symptoms, and they will definitely tell you they have decreased vision. And when you look at the eye, you'll see their eye, their cornea looks hazy, or you know, you may have heard of a steamy cornea as a buzzword uh, on many exams. And the reason the cornea is steamy is the pressure is so high that instead of being optically clear, uh, the fluid has been pushed into the corneal endothelium and you have microcystic edema of the cornea. That's why the cornea is hazy. Um, and then these are the folks where even with no equipment, you touch their eye, it's rock hard. Uh, this is an urgent, urgent referral. In order to treat the, this, they need urgent laser treatment. Um, if not, they can go blind within hours. And then of course, um, these you're unlikely to encounter in most routine practice, unless you work at shock trauma or similar, uh, similar place, you will, uh, you, you can see some of these um, eye trauma. So it, some of it can look blood and thunder like this one. You know, there's chemosis, there's injection, there's blood, or something can be as benign as this. This was someone who probably had like a uh, sharp injury. So it could have been like a tree branch or something that has perforated just a part of the eye and then the iris is sticking out. So that's an open globe injury. All of this, again, urgent referrals because they need urgent surgical treatment. So I think we're pretty close to being done with time. So I have some summary there and I'll see if there are any questions. And if there's any interest, I can briefly talk about diabetic retinopathy for the next couple slides, which I think with the growing epidemic of diabetes, I think it's helpful to be knowledgeable about some of that as well. Any questions? No, okay. So diabetes, as you know, all of you deal with it. It, it. it is something we will be dealing more and more as the as more younger people are developing it and as the population ages. Now diabetic retinopathy specifically has now become the leading cause of legal blindness uh, in the United States. And you can see the age group. It's everywhere from 24 to 70. And um, this costs the United States about 500 million annually, and this number is only going to increase. Um, and uh, diabetic retinopathy, is, you're almost guaranteed to get it if you're type one. So even with the best glycemic control, if you've had it for 20 years, 99% of the folks will have some type of diabetic retinopathy. And then type two, about 60%. Um, so really, you don't want to wait until someone has end organ damage. Uh, prevention and treatment is key. And then risk factors for diabetic retinopathy, it's unsurprising. It is the same risk factors that can cause nephropathy or other end organ damage. So you're looking at things like age of diagnosis, duration, how well controlled they are, pregnancy, huge risk factor. Um, and we'll talk about some of the guidelines for when pregnant women should be screened and there are others listed there as well. The pathogenesis, of course, is microangiopathy. You have um, basement membrane thickening, endothelial cell damage, you have occlusion, and then you have capillary leakage. And we'll talk about how all of these look. The three main causes of how vision is lost in diabetic retinopathy, one is probably macular edema. Remember I showed you macula as the central part of the vision. There's fluid accumulation due to those capillary occlusion in that area it can cause decrease in vision. Macular ischemia, this is much worse. So there's just as an edema, those blood vessels are non-functioning. So that can over time lead to loss of photoreceptors. So lead to cause permanent vision damage. 
and then of course any sequela from ischemia induced neovascularization. This is what diabetic retinopathy looks um, on a microvascular level. This is a fluorescein angiogram. So this is fluorescein dye that's been injected into the vein. We've taken pictures of the eye. You could see sort of the vein, the arteries. The veins are thicker, of course, than the arteries. This is in the macula. Normally, the macula has a foveal avascular zone. That's why you don't see any perfusion there. It's dark, is no perfusion. Anything that's bright is extra perfusion. So you, here you could see an area of neovascularization, so abnormal blood vessels that are leaking, in an area of ischemia. So you have all this area of non-perfusion that has led to neovascularization. Mild diabetic retinopathy typically needs no treatment. It looks like this. There's usually some vascular tortuosity. There's small dot blot hemorrhages. There might be some cotton wool spots. But the macula, for the most part, is intact. Now moderate, we're seeing more of the same changes. We're seeing exudates from some of those leaking capillaries. We're seeing more of the dot blot hemorrhages. But we're not seeing any proliferative changes. And then in severe, these are just more magnified and more present in the posterior pole or the central part of the vision. This person probably also has some macular edema. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy is a whole other condition. This is much more serious. This, there's so much ischemia in the eye that it has led to these proliferative vessels growing in the back of the eye. If it grows on the optic nerve, we call, call that neovascularization of the disc. Now some of those blood vessels have bled and there's vitreous hemorrhage. And if this goes on long enough, it forms these tractional bands and that has detached the retina through a tractional retinal detachment. Uh, again, you could see sort of some of the pre-retinal fibrosis and traction. The neovascularization can even come into the anterior chamber, so you could get neovascularization of the iris, which can cause an acute angle closure that's secondary to neovascularization. And of course, lots of bleeding with the proliferative. Diabetic macular edema, normal eye, this is what the structure looks like. This here is an OCT, or an ocular coherence tomograph, which gives you sort of a histopathologic equivalent layering of the retina. The retina is made up of nine layers. You could see all nine layers here, and they're compact in a normal eye, and they dip down right at the fovea. In an eye with edema, you could see how all those structures are disrupted. And you could see there are pockets of fluid. So fluid in the, these are all interretinal fluid, that's subretinal fluid. That is damaging the photoreceptors. And if the photoreceptors are damaged, there's no recovering um, that vision. So of course, in all of these cases, prevention is key. And when we talk about prevention, there's primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. Primary, of course, is strict glycemic blood pressure control. Secondary is getting annual eye exams. So anyone with diabetes should be getting an annual eye exam. And we'll talk about the timeline in the next slide. And then tertiary prevention is what we do as ophthalmologists, whether we're injecting these eyes with antivascular endothelial growth factors, or doing laser or even retinal surgery. So when should these patients be screened? If they're type one, within three to five years of diagnosis, they have time. Because type one diabetics immediately, when they're diagnosed, they typically have decompensation that you know they have diabetes. They don't go for many years being undetected. Type two, a lot of times, they may have had it for a few years before they showed up in your office or got screened for it. So they should be sent uh, at the time of diagnosis and then followed yearly. If they're prenatal or gestational, it doesn't matter if they're type one or type two. Ideally, they should be seen prior to conception and early in the first trimester. If there's no retinopathy um, or mild to moderate non-proliferative retinopathy, they could be seen three to 12 months. If they're already severe at baseline, they may need to be seen every month or every three months. I have, there's some horror stories of young w women pregnant, never saw an eye doctor delivered, and then are permanently blind in one eye or both. So how do we treat this? Uh, locally, as I mentioned, we do laser injection or surgery. Laser involves putting spots into the back of the eye that look like this. This is a non-invasive procedure. We put a lens on the eye and focus laser beams into um, photocoagulate. This treats the ischemic retina. 
So if there's no longer an ischemic retina, it drives down the ischemic drive, so it shouldn't lead to production of additional uh, anti, uh, excuse me, vascular endothelial growth factors. Uh, if uh, injections aren't alone enough, we can inject anti-VEGF agents, so things like ranibizumab or Lucentis, which was the first agent um, formulated for the eye. So with a tiny gauge needle, we can inject it directly into the vitreous cavity, and that can go act at the site of that leaking blood vessel. So this is done in the office. Or if things get too bad, some of those last few pictures I showed you where there's hemorrhage or retinal detachment, uh, they may need vitrectomy or retinal surgery to reattach the retina, but often prognosis is poor. Um, I want to end by thanking one of my colleagues, Dr. Risha, who had uh, put together some of the initial slides, and then I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Well, thank you very much. So, so that's a good question. Uh, so the question was when I showed you those pictures where the retina is disrupted by the macular edema, is there permanent damage to the rods and cones and the other cells like the amacrine and the horizontal cells that convey that information uh, to the optic nerve? Uh, the answer is no if caught early. So that's why treatment is key. So if, if a patient presents with that edema, a lot of times you do one injection and within four weeks, their retina is flat looking like the one on the right. So if you can get that fluid out, close off that bleeding vessel, you can prevent permanent damage. Now, if that's been sitting there for six months, a year, uh, or is treatment resistant, even if they're getting treatment, uh, that can over time damage the photoreceptors, which is where, which are the most sensitive cells. Everything else can either, you know, a, a horizontal cell, if one dies, the other one can take over and form connections. But if the photoreceptors die, uh, there's no replacing them. So if, if it goes on long enough, it can damage. So I am not 100% um, certain on what the data is behind that, but it's just known that for whatever reason uh, in pregnant women, especially if they have poor glycemic control or already underlying um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the rate at which they progress can be much, much faster. Now, normally if someone has proliferative diabetic retinopathy that's being treated with laser or with injection, we typically say let's follow that every three to four months because that's the typical rate at which we expect change to occur. In pregnancy, it could be as soon as a month. And, and I don't know what the underlying factor is because I don't think that's been entirely studied. We just know that that population is more vulnerable. So the question was, can you have glaucoma with normal pressure? Absolutely. Uh, my training is as a glaucoma specialist. So there's a type of glaucoma called normal tension glaucoma or low tension glaucoma. Uh, the thing to remember in glaucoma is the eye pressure is a risk factor. It is not part of the uh, definition of the condition. So glaucoma is optic nerve damage. And the risk factors for that include aging, genetics, and eye pressure. So, so we treat it the same way, we just need to lower that eye pressure further. Even if the pressure is yes, even if it's in the normal range, we usually tell the patient it's too high for the physiology of their eye. Because out of all the risk factors for glaucoma, the pressure is the only modifiable risk factor. I cannot keep someone from aging. I cannot change their genetics yet. Uh, maybe that's coming in the future. Um, so our treatment is on what we can modify, which is the intraocular pressure. And there's evidence, there's plenty of evidence. There's a big study uh, that showed if you could lower the intraocular pressure by 30%, even in the normotensive or the low tension glaucoma patients, it prevents progression of the condition. It really depends on the stage and the severity. So their treatment for glaucoma goes all the way from eye drops to laser to 
minimally invasive glaucoma surgery and much more invasive glaucoma surgery. So there's a wide range of options. Uh, if, if someone is willing to take medications, usually that's the first place to start. Uh, if the glaucoma has progressed enough or they've been refractory to more conservative treatments, that's when we will usually do surgery. A lot of the minimally invasive glaucoma treatments can be easily combined with cataract surgery. So these days, when I have patients who have glaucoma who are well controlled on one or two drops, if they require cataract surgery, I will offer them glaucoma surgery with it because it doesn't add any extra risk. It doesn't add any extra healing to what they're already undergoing, uh, but it could get them off a drop or get them off two drops. So that helps with compliance. The fewer medicines they have to take, the better they are taking it. So, so the answer is a little bit more complex than just when to do it or not. Uh, it's patient, stage, uh, how aggressive the glaucoma is dependent. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity.